I'm Zod. This is Superman. I've been taking care of him for the last two years. Dion took care of him for the uh, two years prior. I needed, I needed, I needed a platform to say thank you to this man. And I'm just gonna get right to it. When I was 10 years old, and Dion was at that game, we were in a championship game, and we were beating this team drastically. Dad took a chance and took father's privilege and took me out of second base and put me on the mound. And I, I hope he remembers that because this is, it changed my life. I ran from it, but I came back to it. I got on the mound and I was pitching horribly. You know, I was, <laughs> I know thank you for remembering. I was pitching horribly. I was walking everybody where people were hitting. The score got to 17-16 in the final innings. The last batter that came to bat, we called the kid Frankenstein because he was six foot two and he was 10 years old. He was the home run king. You couldn't ask for a better scenario. It was three balls, two strikes, and I was, I was crying while I was on the mound. So there was one point my dad was always on first base. I looked at him and I we called the timeout and I ran over to him. And while I was doing that, you could hear the crowd booing. Now these are a bunch of 10 year olds, Dion. Yeah. Mad at my dad for making the decision that he made and putting a second string pitcher on the mound. I ran over to him and I begged him, please take me off the mound. Please take me off the mound. My stomach was hurting, I was snotting, I was begging, I was doing everything I could to get dad to take me off the mound. Please put Joe in, and Joe was our best pitcher at the time. My dad grabbed me by the arms. He sh I'm gonna keep it really real because he'd probably be in, in jail if he'd if done, this, done this nowadays. He shook me, and he gave me a little smack. And he says, you get your butt out there and throw the damn ball. <laughs> I walked back to the mound because I had no choice. It wasn't because I, I wanted to heed his word. I had no choice because I was afraid of what was going to happen when I got home. I got back on the mound, and for a second, the world slowed down. I could hear the jeers, I could hear the boos, and somewhere it resonated again, Cleon just throw the damn ball. I didn't have my eyes open when I threw it. I threw that ball, and, and you could hear it, I could hear the wind blow as the ball was going, and then I heard the ref go, Steve Wright, you're out! I opened my eyes and you could hear pandemonium, and I could care less what was going around. I looked to first base, and the first place I ran, was to this man. And now this, he's an affectionate man, but the big hugs he don't do. I jumped at his arm and he said, son, I don't care what you do in life. You just need to throw the damn ball. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I, I say that to say I ran from that. This man was a postal worker. He had laundromats. He gave up being a postal worker to run a laundromat. He ran construction companies. And then he had the nerve to run and do a restaurant, make run a restaurant with the family. And we had no idea how to run a restaurant. But that's the kind of brilliant man he, he is. I watched that process and I got a fear of success because I watched him make it, I watched him lose it. I said, you know what? I think I'm I, I think I'm good. I think I just want to get a job, work UPS, and you know, and I'm good. I just rather have that kind of job security. Um, I picked law enforcement. Thank God for that. Our business shut down and I had no choice. I had to get a job. And somewhere in 2002, 2003, oh, I had started a business at the same time. And I got a taste of that freedom. And the first per thing I thought of with that story at 10 years old, throw the damn ball. Now I took a risk and started a business and it was successful. It is successful. I'm not in the red, but again, I'm not balling, as you can see. <laughs> you know, this isn't cribs. But I'm happy, I'm free in the mind, because this man right here taught me everything. And he taught me by example. I do remember those times when you would bring me to the bank and you would sit me in front of all these big wigs. I remember those times when I was, I was acting a fool and you still dragged me to City Hall to meet all your friends and you know white, black, or everything indifferent. And my brother can tell you the same thing. All that stuff stuck with me because it helped me be have a broad perspective. I had a father and a mother. You know, somebody needs to hear that story. I had a, a great dad. Because you didn't have the big education, you didn't go to college, but you should seem to have a drive. You had a fire that nobody could put out. And, and, and what is something you can share with people? How to keep that going? How to even get that started? The main thing I, I had to drive that. But the, the main thing is is love. If you got that, you got everything. You know, 
I was determined that my kids were going to be raised up in a fashionable manner, and I did that. I was very strict. But I, <laughs> yeah. They were also strict because they were teaching us responsibility. Right. I was seven years old changing diapers. Okay. I had to change my nephew, we called it dump the lump. I changed my <laughs> nephew's diaper, my niece's diaper. <laughs> there are 41 Foster's kids that come around, I'm changing their diapers and I'm watching them. I couldn't go out because of them. But for some reason, I hated it then, but it made me a great father. Mm -hmm. But the key is the foundation. There was a foundation that he and my mom laid for us for how we're supposed to raise a family. Now the house may be built a little different, but the foundation is the same. Being strict is not always just letting you do what you want to do. Sometimes it's tough love. Sometimes and that's what true. they gave us. I, I thank Kim for every whooping. And we didn't get whooped much. All it took was one. How many times you got? I got only, I only got whipped six times with my dad. My mom probably whipped us a thousand. We got whooped for fighting each other. Yeah. We, we, me, my brother and I, we never fought physically until we were 13 years old. It was over something stupid. Super. He had the light on, and I wanted it off, and next thing we're wild in our bedroom. Yeah, yeah. And he comes in and gave us the worst whooping up. Me, my brother and I, because of that whooping we got at 13, we don't even like to argue. <laughs> it was, we're grown, hold on, we're grown men. We're watching a Super Bowl one day. I bet you got her. <laughs> it was and even heated. We're grown men, and he's old, right? And we're sitting there watching that, and we were starting to get heated. He said one word, knock it off. Look how big he is and look how ripped I am. We sat back in our chair and we sat quiet for about 15 minutes. Having this man sitting right here between us shows the importance of having a father in your life. A father in a kid's life is just that important. It goes even beyond that. For us men in my generation, I don't know what we're, baby boomers, generation X, it's our responsibility to be America's dad. Yeah, it kicked in for me uh, when I got to Skid Row. I've been working for the police department for 20 years. I got to Skid Row in 1997, and uh, between the time I left the house and, and, and got my own job, I was rebellious. So then I ended up in Skid Row, and uh, I told my mother, I didn't tell him, I said, Mom, I'm never going to be like you guys. I said, you guys help people and they turn around and crap on you, steal from you, talk about you, and you keep helping them, keep helping them. That's not going to be me. No, I got to love people from a distance. I got to do it different. And then I get to skip roll the worst place in the United States of America. You talking about inhumanity? You talk about human beings being left in the street like animals, marginalized, destroying each other, beating each other up, genocide? I was in the middle of it. And for the first six months, I was praying to God to get me the out of there. But about the sixth month, people just kept coming to me and saying, it's something about you. You're not gonna pass me by. I need help, I just got stabbed. Can you help me? And sure enough, I would stop whatever, I was in the watch, it was time for me to go home, and I just put my, put my hands down, I was like, yes, I will help you. The word started to spread that there's this cop out there that no matter your social status, no matter who you are, he's gonna bend over backwards to get you justice. And it started to spread like wildfire. And uh, it was true. That's when my DNA kicked in because of this man right here. I saw them help people who didn't even appreciate it. You ever hear a story about Jesus who helped heal 10 lepers and only one came back? That's, 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 that's him. That's this man right here. That's this man. And it was happening to me too. And it worked because from 2006 to 2010, Skid Row was actually clean and safe. Because I never stopped loving. I never stopped caring. And that's all, it, it, it did work. So it did, no man, you can't run from you who you are. Can't. My dad was a man. All I saw him, I, and I don't care, all the, the, the man that my brother and I saw was a man. He taught us to be confident, but to be humble at the same time, not be arrogant. Uh, my dad, as my brother said, employed people who needed a second chance, ex-cons. He never told me that I was digging a ditch next to an ex-murderer. He never told me I was wiring That's a house great. next great. to a drug dealer. I hated drug dealers for what they did to my community. Uh, but he never told me that because he wanted to give him a second chance. He never called them his employees. He always called them, these are my friends. I'm the same way. You gotta, uh, I don't know how, how you say it. You gotta walk uh, like a king at all times but live like a servant. That's how I live my life. That's how he lives his life. In my mind, I'm a king because he's a king. But when somebody comes to me and needs my help, what can I do for you? It's important to know 
I can accept the fact that I'm a king. And please, young people, accept the fact that you're a king or Be queen. A king or queen. Discipline is not designed to take away your freedom. It's designed to give you a freedom nobody can take away from you. That's it. There is a jealousy issue with me and my dad, and here it is. Talk about that. Well, we all, we do look similar, but I always ask him why couldn't I have his eyes? <laughs> because, oh, that would, uh, the ladies would have loved that even more. <laughs> the thing about my dad's eyes, they change with emotion. We knew so he was mad. It can go from blue to red to green. It's amazing, you know? And uh, wherever we go together, oh, look at him fire Joseph. Boy, when they see that dad, ooh, Mr. Joseph. <laughs> yeah. and the, now, dad's funny too, you know. I don't think I can quite get away with, with what I'm about to say. He got away with it. This guy can walk up to you and say, you about the ugliest son of a gun I've never seen. Not even know you. And then you guys become best friends. I never saw anything like that. I don't think I can get away with that. I watched him walk up to this lady in the bank. Hi, Mr. Joseph. You about the ugliest woman I've ever seen. You know what that lady did? Hee hee hee, Mr. Joseph, you're such a flirt. <laughs> How do you get away with that, Dad? I'll never forget it. But it's a charm. Oh, he walk up to big people and say, I don't know. Oh, that's, the first, that's the first thing he would say. That was his introduction. That was his introduction to you. Yeah. Like, oh, you're a big I'm going to whoop your And they just laugh. Next thing you know, they're best friends. That's, that's, how, that's how we got in. He was staying at the nursing home. Uh, there was this, uh, every time I would visit him, there was this one guy that would get on the elevator at the same time. So Dad would have his little cane and he says you ready for me to whoop your <laughs> and I'm like dad you don't even know this dude you know and the dude's just loving it you know I mean dad has a way of motivating people you know and, and when I was young I thought he would tell the corniest jokes you know you know people were just eating it up you know so I saw him try to sing one day in church he had everybody standing up this man can't sing I never saw my dad be afraid of anybody you know even when I knew he he shouldn't walk up and talk to a certain person <laughs> yeah, because he's just too old to fight. Never challenge my dad. Never challenge. Never challenge my dad. He played racquetball was his favorite That's sport. That's where we're going to get into. Yeah. And this is a five foot six man and he would, and people would challenge him. Well, I don't know what, this one guy was like six six who would always challenge him and he was like, let's go. I'm the same way. I'm like, it's insane. It's insane. It's insane. He put that in work not to fear any challenge. If something was hard, he went at it. He didn't run. He didn't think about it. He didn't debate. He went at it. And he didn't care if he succeeded or failed. And that was it. Now, we want to brag about you a little bit, you know. And I, if you can remember, can you just run down some of the things you did all in your life as far as work? Because that's all I know my dad working. I was in the uh, construction business, real estate, loans. Did most of everything in the business. And I was successful most of the time. It was a hard, little hard time, but I never, never gave up. I'm close to the end, but I ain't there yet. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. <laughs> How did you manage your business, family, uh, your kids? How did you manage that? How did you do it all? Because I find myself doing the same thing now. And balance it. How did you find the balance when you did it? Well, it was easy for me. First, that was love. And that was essential. I made good of it. I took my kids wherever I went. Whatever I had to do, I'd take them with me. I was never afraid to the men with me. I was going to do something that was not intentional to hell. So I, I thought I did a good job. Matter of fact, I've done a good, darn good job. <laughs> Dad, how do you feel about your son? Great. <laughs> Great. <laughs> Well, it, was, it wasn't easy, but nothing that easy. But I had some pretty good kids. Yeah. Are you proud of them? Oh, yeah. Very proud. I can see that. They love you dearly. Yeah, I love them. <laughs> <laughs>